I have been with my girlfriend for three years. I have a 13-year-old son, James, and she has an 11-year-old son, Mark. Mark and James have different bedtimes. Mark goes to bed at 8, and James goes to bed at 9. Mark also has severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, and a lot of emotional regulation problems. Due to his issues, my son isn't particularly fond of him. They butt heads a lot mainly because my son doesn't think that they get fair treatment, and usually it is surrounding bedtime. Mark often fights us to go to sleep, and by the time we finally get him to stop throwing a tantrum, it's around 8.45. James feels that he should be able to stay up later because Mark is awake until 8.45, which is 45 minutes past his bedtime. So at that point, James runs his mouth nearly every night about it not being fair to him, and that he should be able to stay up 45 minutes later, However, this also happens even when it takes only 10 minutes to get Mark in bed. James gets pissed off, runs his mouth, and says he should be able to stay up an hour later because Mark was in bed at 8.10 versus 8 p.m. when he was supposed to be. My son can be a dink sometimes when it comes to running his mouth, and he's been spoken to so many times, grounded more often than he should be as well because he is disrespectful when running his mouth. So in no way am I condoning his shoot behavior here. I've been trying to correct it, but he's a kid, and he's just being a jerk. Anywho, at 8.15 last night, my girlfriend was trying to get Mark down for bed, and it's becoming a problem because it's just a bad night. James goes into Mark's room where my girlfriend was and says, So I'm staying up an hour later then. My girlfriend says, No, you're not actually, get out. This sends Mark into a conniption, because now he thinks James is staying up an hour later, because James is running his mouth and Mark doesn't process information the same way we do. So it sends Mark into a new round of fits. James didn't leave the room and instead says, tell me how this is fair. Explain this to me. Why is he staying up every damn night? But I can't. My girlfriend again told him to leave the room. I go in and before I can even open my mouth, James says something under his breath and my girlfriend loses her shoot. I have never seen her be anything other than a kind, overly patient woman so this was a complete shock to the system. She screams, get the frick out and mind your own freaking business. James immediately shuts up and walks out, but apparently that wasn't enough because she just snapped. Again, this is not normal. She followed him out into the hallway and said, better yet, pack your freaking shoot. You're no longer welcome in my house. Go back to your mom's. I step in completely, told James he is once again grounded from everything and to go to his room, and then told my girlfriend to step outside and calm down. She's still flipping out at this point and says, if that kid is still in my freaking house by the time I come back in here, then I will call the cops and have him removed. I am so freaking tired of that little puke disrespecting me and you doing jack shoot to stop it. She goes outside. I go talk to James, tell him he's out of line and this will be the last time he opens his mouth to run it. When my girlfriend comes back in, I tell her she needs to go apologize to my son and that he will not be moving out, actually. She says, I will evict you if he doesn't leave. Actually, no. I think you need to leave anyway. I'm freaking done. She told my sister today that she truly wants both of us gone and took off for the day with her and her kid and told me I had better be out of her house before she returns. I have nowhere to go and don't plan to leave, but I still think she's being ridiculous. Am I the jerk for refusing to kick my son out and demanding she apologize to my son? To add, I have been living in her home for three months. She bought it long before we met, but technically she would have to serve me an eviction to get me out of here. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, have you even asked your girlfriend what James said under his breath or did you hear what he said and are not repeating it to get more people on your side? For a woman who you said has never been anything but kind and overly patient to kick off like that, you know that what your son said was really bad, but you won't tell anyone what it was. Then you tell her to apologize to him? Some honesty from you here seems necessary. Comment two, it takes both people to want to keep a relationship going, and it sounds like she no longer wants to. So why would you not leave? You would be the one at fault for dragging out the inevitable separation, especially when there are two kids involved who don't get along. Now, for the update, thanks for reading my previous post. So, here's what happened over the past week. After my girlfriend stormed out, I was left in a house that felt like it was about to explode. I knew I had to do something, so I called my sister and explained the situation. 
She suggested I take James and stay with her for a few days to let things cool down. I didn't want to leave, but I also didn't want to escalate things further. So I packed a few things for James and me, and we headed to my sister's place. The first night at my sister's was rough. James was quiet, which is unusual for him. I could tell he was processing everything that had happened. I tried to talk to him, but he just shrugged and said he was tired. I let it go, hoping he'd open up when he was ready. The next day, I got a call from my girlfriend. She was calmer, but still firm. She said she needed space and that it would be best if James and I stayed away for a while. I asked her if she was serious about the eviction, and she said she was. She said she couldn't live in a house where she felt disrespected and undermined. I tried to reason with her, but she was adamant. Over the next few days, I started looking for a place to stay. My sister's apartment was small, and it was clear we couldn't stay there long term. I reached out to a few friends, but no one had space for both James and me. I even considered going back to my ex-wife's place, but that was a last resort. Meanwhile, James was acting out. He was rude to my sister and her kids, and he refused to do his schoolwork. I knew he was struggling with everything that was happening, but I didn't know how to help him. I felt like I was failing him as a father. On the fourth day, my girlfriend called again. She said she wanted to talk in person. I agreed, hoping we could find a way to work things out. We met at a coffee shop, and she started by apologizing for how she had handled things. She said she was overwhelmed, and that she shouldn't have taken it out on James. I appreciated her apology, but I could tell she was still upset. We talked for a while, and she explained that she felt like I wasn't supporting her when it came to disciplining James. She said she felt like I was always taking his side and that it was causing a rift between us. I tried to explain that I was just trying to be fair, but she said it didn't feel that way to her. Then she dropped a shocker. She said she had been talking to her ex-husband, Mark's father, and that he had offered to take Mark full time. She said she was considering it because she didn't know how else to manage everything. I was shocked. I knew she struggled with Mark's behavior, but I didn't think she would consider sending him to live with his dad full time. I didn't know what to say. On one hand, I understood her need for a break. On the other hand, I couldn't imagine her without Mark. I asked her if she was sure and she said she wasn't, but she didn't see any other option. She said she needed time to think and that she would let me know her decision soon. After our conversation, I felt even more lost. I didn't know what to do or how to fix things. I spent the next few days trying to find a place for James and me, but I wasn't having any luck. My sister was getting frustrated, and I knew we couldn't stay there much longer. Then on the sixth day, my girlfriend called again. She said she had made a decision. She was going to send Mark to live with his dad for a while. She said it wasn't permanent, but she needed a break to figure things out. She also said she wanted James and me to come back, but there would be new rules. She said James needed to respect her and that I needed to support her more when it came to disciplining him. I didn't know how to feel. I was relieved that we had a place to stay, but I was also worried about the new rules. I knew James wouldn't take it well and I didn't want to put him in a situation where he felt unwelcome. But I also knew we didn't have many options. I talked to James about it and he was upset. He said he didn't want to go back and that he didn't like my girlfriend anymore. I tried to explain that we didn't have a choice, but he just got more upset. He said he wanted to go live with his mom, but I knew that wasn't an option either. In the end, I decided to go back to my girlfriend's house. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I hoped we could find a way to make it work. When we got there, my girlfriend was waiting for us. She hugged me and said she was glad we were back. She also apologized to James and said she hoped they could start over. James was still upset, but he nodded and went to his room. The first few days back were tense. My girlfriend and I were trying to navigate the new rules, and James was still acting out. But we were trying. I was trying to be more supportive of my girlfriend, and she was trying to be more patient with James. It wasn't perfect, but it was a start. So that's where we are now. We're trying to make it work, but it's not easy. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm hopeful we can find a way to make it work. Thanks for reading. Am I the idiot for kicking out my in-laws after they trashed my dad's memorial and stole my stuff? Female 25, lost my father a year ago. He was the kindest person in the world and worked as an emergency medical technician. He died after being hit by a drunk driver while trying to help another driver with car trouble. 
He was my hero and a huge part of my life. He became a widower father to me when I was seven, and he was the best dad anybody could ever ask for. To honor his memory, I keep a small shrine in our living room with his photo, some of his belongings, and a few of his favorite things along with his urn. It brings me comfort and helps me feel like he's still with me. My husband, male 30, has always been supportive of this, but his parents, both in their 60s, have never understood. They think it's morbid and unhealthy to keep such a display. They've made their opinions known multiple times, but I've always brushed it off, explaining it helps me cope. This past weekend, my in-laws came to visit. From the moment they arrived, they were making snide comments about the shrine. My mother-in-law said, it's time to let go of the past. And my father-in-law chimed in with, it's not good for your mental health to live in a museum of grief. I told them, firmly but politely, that the shrine stays and it's not up for discussion. Things escalated quickly. When I left the room to take a phone call, they decided to take matters into their own hands. I walked back in to find them packing away my father's things into a box. I was livid. I told them to stop immediately and put everything back. They refused, saying they were helping me move on. I lost it. I yelled at them to get out of my house. My mother-in-law started crying, saying I was ungrateful and that they were just trying to help. My father-in-law called me hysterical and said I was disrespecting them. My husband tried to mediate, but I was too furious to listen. I told them they had no right to touch my father's things and that they were not welcome in my home if they couldn't respect my boundaries. I discovered as I was putting things back that some of my belongings I had placed on the shrine were gone. A small stuffed cat, his mat for Magic the Gathering, and his shot glass from screaming in when he went to Newfoundland with my mom before she died of cancer. All three things have very low value monetarily, but a lot of sentimental value. My husband has told me I'm overreacting over a molehill and that I'm just sensitive because I was a daddy's girl when my dad was alive. I'm having a hard time letting go of my dad because we were so close. He was literally my best friend for the last five years of his life. I may be so swamped in my own grief that I was in jerk over nothing. I'm confused and sad. Am I the jerk? Now for an update. I was banned from Am I the Jerk because it violates Rule 11. No posts about relationships. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. I would be on my way to the local police department to get a no trespassing order and to find out if what they did was considered a form of grave desecration. Since this is literally where you have his ashes and the things he would have been buried with, had that been the route you chose. My next stop would be a lawyer to file for legal separation, since my husband thinks it is fine for his parents to steal a dead person's effects. Comment 2. Not the idiot. Your husband is the biggest one, then his parents come in a close second. He should have shut that shoot down a long time ago. He should be getting the lost, stolen things back now. And until they are returned, an apology to you and a promise to never bring it up again. No one has the right to touch anything in someone else's house. Ever. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me through all this. So, after that disastrous weekend with my in-laws, things have only gotten more complicated. My husband and I had a huge argument about what happened. He kept insisting that I was overreacting and that his parents were just trying to help. I felt like he was completely dismissing my feelings and the importance of my dad's shrine. It was like he didn't understand how much it meant to me. Or maybe he just didn't care. This led to a lot of tension between us, and we barely spoke for a couple of days. Midweek, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I called my in-laws to try and get back the items they took from the shrine. My mother-in-law answered and was surprisingly calm. She said they had taken the items because they thought it would force me to move on and that they had no intention of giving them back. I was furious but tried to keep my cool. I told her that those items were irreplaceable to me and that I needed them back. She said she would think about it and hung up. The next day, I got a call from my father-in-law. He was much more aggressive and told me that I needed to grow up and that keeping the shrine was unhealthy. He said they would only give the items back if I agreed to dismantle the shrine permanently. I was shocked and didn't know what to say. I felt like I was being blackmailed. I hung up the phone and broke down in tears. That evening, I told my husband about the conversation. He was surprisingly quiet and didn't say much. I could tell he was conflicted, but he didn't offer any support or solutions. 
I felt completely alone and didn't know what to do. I decided to reach out to a grief counselor for some advice. The counselor was very understanding and suggested that I write a letter to my in-laws explaining why the shrine was so important to me and how their actions were affecting my mental health. I spent the next day writing the letter. I poured my heart into it, explaining how much my dad meant to me and how the shrine helped me feel connected to him. I also explained how their actions were causing me a lot of pain and stress. I asked them to please return the items and respect my way of grieving. I sent the letter to my in-laws and waited anxiously for a response. A couple of days later, I received a call from my mother-in-law. She sounded genuinely sorry and said she hadn't realized how much the shrine meant to me. She agreed to return the items and apologized for overstepping. I was relieved but still felt a bit wary. When my in-laws came over to return the items, my husband and I sat down with them to have a serious conversation. I reiterated how important the shrine was to me and asked them to respect my boundaries in the future. My father-in-law was still a bit stubborn, but eventually agreed to back off. My mother-in-law seemed more understanding and even offered to help me set the shrine back up. After they left, my husband and I had a long talk. He admitted that he had been struggling with how to support me while also dealing with his parents' opinions. He apologized for not being more supportive and promised to stand by me from now on. It was a difficult conversation, but it felt like a step in the right direction. In the days that followed, I noticed a change in my husband. He started asking more about my dad and even shared some memories of his own. It was like he was finally trying to understand my grief and be there for me. We started working on our communication and making an effort to support each other better. As for my in-laws, things are still a bit tense, but they seem to be trying to respect my boundaries. My mother-in-law even called to check on me a couple of times, which was a nice gesture. I think they realized that their approach was wrong and are trying to make amends. Looking back, I realized that this whole situation forced me to confront my grief in a new way. It made me realize how important it is to stand up for myself and my needs, even when it's difficult. It also showed me that my husband and I still have a lot of work to do in our relationship, but we're willing to put in the effort. Thanks for reading. Am I the idiot for letting my cheating husband stay after his mistress blamed me for her miscarriage? I don't know where to begin or where to end this story. I can't discuss this with anyone I know because I feel like a jerk, while also feeling justified at the same time. This story will also sound made up, but it's really not, and I'm just hurting and want some place to type it all out too. I, 36-year-old female, have been with my husband, 39-year-old male, for over a decade. Early on, I had to have a hysterectomy due to health complications and told him if he wanted kids, we should go our separate ways. He insisted he was strictly child-free and didn't want kids. In every other way, we were perfect for each other. A few years into our marriage, we even had the chance to adopt a little girl from a family member's unplanned pregnancy. I was thrilled, but he still didn't want kids, so she was adopted elsewhere. Not being a mom hurt, but I accepted it. But I... Sometime back, my husband started acting weird. You know how you just know when someone you love changes? He came home late, avoided intimacy, and was cold. He denied anything was wrong, but I could tell he was lying. Whenever I tried to talk to him about it, he'd tell me I'm being psycho and controlling. So I snooped through his phone and found evidence of a very long affair. I'm not proud of it, but I did it. I needed that peace of mind. His mistress, 26 or 27-year-old female, whom he'd introduced to me as his cousin, was around less than two months pregnant. They were discussing marriage after he divorced me. He admitted he didn't want to divorce me yet because he would lose our house, which I funded entirely. He'd also been using our joint account, which I contribute significantly more to, I earn considerably more than him, to pay for her rent and hospital expenses. When I confronted him, he admitted to the affair and her pregnancy. She came over and things got heated. I tried to blame him, not her, but after a lot of tears and fighting, I lost control and told them that I hoped they lost the child. I'm not proud of it, but I said it. He moved out of my house the next day, not sure where they live now. A few weeks later, she had a miscarriage. They blame me and believe I caused it. She came to our house, slapped me, banged my head against the wall and kicked me. I was not significantly injured. 
He didn't hurt me physically, but he didn't stop her either. Yes, I was foolish to let them in, but I am in a weird mental state too and didn't expect her to hit me. Maybe I deserved it. I may have felt the same if someone said something like that about my unborn child and lost it. I won't file charges because it's not an option in my country, and maybe I deserved the beating for what I said. I just want to know if I'm the jerk, and if yes, how big of a jerk I am. Thanks. To add, what I said was so unforgivable in my religion. Wishing something bad on an unborn baby is like unforgivable. It's not some small thing that's why I feel like a jerk. A child is considered God's blessing. I said all that and cursed them. And maybe my anger and envy created Nazar. That's why I think I'm the jerk. Logically, I know I didn't cause it to actually happen, but the bad thing happened because I thought bad, and because I was hurt, my bad thoughts had effect. Now for a few comments before the update. I saw your post regarding cursing another woman and the evil eye. So how do you know she wasn't cursing you first? wishing for you to be deceased so your husband and she could get everything. If anything, her curse rebounded and took something of greater value. You didn't cause anything. These people are just looking to blame you for their own moral failings, and they did so violently. Also, what the hell? You can't press charges against someone who came into your own home and hit you? I'm so sorry your country is terrible. Now for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for reading. So, a lot has happened since my last update, and it's been very eventful of emotions and events. Three days ago, I was at home, trying to piece my life back together after everything that happened. I was still reeling from the confrontation and the miscarriage. I felt like I was walking around in a fog, not really sure what to do next. Then, out of the blue, my husband showed up at the house. He looked terrible, disheveled, tired, and like he hadn't slept in days, he asked if we could talk, and against my better judgment, I let him in. We sat down in the living room, and he started to apologize. He said he was sorry for everything, for the affair, for lying, for using our money to support his mistress, and for not stopping her when she attacked me. He admitted that he had been selfish, and that he had taken me for granted. He said he realized too late that he had made a huge mistake, and that he had lost the best thing that ever happened to him. I listened to him, but I didn't say much. I was still so angry and hurt, and I didn't know if I could ever forgive him. But then he dropped a shocker. He told me that his mistress had left him. She blamed him for the miscarriage and for not being able to protect her from my curse. She packed up her things and moved out, leaving him with nothing. He said he had nowhere else to go and that he was hoping I would let him stay, at least for a little while. I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. Part of me wanted to kick him out and tell him to never come back, but another part of me felt sorry for him. He looked so lost and broken, and despite everything, I still cared about him. So I told him he could stay in the guest room for a few days while he figured things out. The next day, I went to work, trying to keep my mind off everything that was happening at home. When I got back, I found my husband in the kitchen, cooking dinner. It was such a strange sight. He had never been much of a cook, and seeing him there, trying to make amends in his own way, brought up a lot of mixed emotions. We sat down to eat, and for the first time in a long time, we had a civil conversation. We talked about mundane things, work, the weather, the news, but it felt like a small step towards normalcy. That night, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard a knock on my bedroom door. It was my husband. He asked if we could talk some more, and I reluctantly agreed. He sat down on the edge of the bed and started to open up about his feelings. He admitted that he had always wanted kids, but he had been too afraid to tell me because he didn't want to hurt me. He said he thought he could suppress those feelings, but when he met his mistress and found out she was pregnant, all those suppressed desires came rushing back. He told me that he felt trapped between his love for me and his longing for a family. He said he didn't know how to reconcile those feelings, so he made a series of terrible decisions that led to where we are now. As he spoke, I could see the pain and regret in his eyes, and for the first time, I started to understand the depth of his internal conflict. The following day, I decided to take a personal day from work. I needed time to process everything and figure out what I wanted to do next. I spent most of the day reflecting on our relationship and the choices we had both made. I thought about the adoption opportunity we had passed up and how different our lives might have been if we had taken that chance. 
I also thought about my own feelings and how much I had suppressed my desire to be a mother for the sake of our marriage. In the afternoon, I went for a walk to clear my head. As I walked through the park, I saw a young couple playing with their toddler. The sight brought tears to my eyes, and I realized just how much I had been denying my own feelings. I had been so focused on making my husband happy that I had neglected my own happiness. When I got back home, I found my husband sitting on the porch, looking lost in thought. I sat down next to him and we talked some more. I told him about my walk and how it had made me realize that I couldn't keep denying my own desires. I told him that I still loved him, but I didn't know if I could ever trust him again. He listened quietly, and then he said something that surprised me. He said he understood if I couldn't forgive him, but he wanted to try to make things right. He said he was willing to go to therapy, both individually and as a couple, to work through his issues and try to rebuild our relationship. That night, as I lay in bed, I thought about everything we had talked about. I knew it wouldn't be easy, and I wasn't sure if we could ever get back to where we were before, but I also knew that I still loved him and I wanted to at least try to make things work. So that's where we are now. We're taking things one day at a time, trying to rebuild our relationship and figure out what the future holds. It's been a difficult journey, but I feel like we're finally starting to make some progress. Thanks for reading. If you liked this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.